there's a militant ignorance that seems to exist in this country right now where people are yeah. woefully ill-informed, under-informed, poorly informed, and they take pride in that. So mm-hmm. my job, first and foremost, is to entertain you. I want everybody to read the book and have a, have a great white knuckle throw ride. If you close the book a little bit smarter, I think that's a good thing because I think yeah. probably, you know, people ask me, what do I think our greatest national security risk is? And I think it's social media. Put that coffee down. Coffee's for closers only. Welcome to Coffee with Closers, a podcast produced by Pinkston, a strategic communications firm headquartered just outside Washington, D.C. We talk with some of America's most influential closers, from industry-leading CEOs to best-selling authors, professional athletes, entrepreneurs, and everyone in between. So grab a cup of coffee and sit back as we take you on an informative, thought-provoking, and highly entertaining journey into the lives of highly successful, driven, and forward-thinking disruptors who are making a lasting impact in their field and on society. On this week's episode of Coffee with Closers, we welcome back to the show number one New York Times bestselling author, Brad Thor. He joins us to discuss his new book, Deadfall. In this page-turning thriller, Thor sends his protagonist, Scott Harvath, an ex-Navy SEAL and America's top spy to war-torn Ukraine. Thor explains why this was the most intense thriller he has ever written. He also shares his thoughts on some of the greatest national security threats facing our country today. Brad Thor, welcome back to Coffee with Closers. Thank you. you It's good to be back. I'm great. Thank you. Yeah, well, good to good to see you. Um, all right, we are here to discuss your twenty uh, second, I believe, book in the uh, Scott Harvest series, Dead Fall. Um, I read it; uh, it was great. Um, so let's start at the beginning here. Um, so you have, you've had your protagonist. Scott Harvath, he was up in the Arctic with Black Ice. Then he was in India with Rising Tiger. Uh, and he and Deadfall starts off with, um, I guess he's in Warsaw w- with uh, trying to meet up with his girlfriend, Solvi, having to have a great weekend and maybe get some downtime. Um, then he gets a call and those plans are quickly dashed. Uh, take us from there. <laughs> So in Deadfall, <laughs> there is uh, some American aid workers have been killed and there's one, uh, there's a body they haven't found. And they're worried yeah. that uh, this person may have suffered, this woman may have suffered uh, an equally grisly fate, that she may have been taken hostage uh, by a, uh, a rogue mercenary unit out of the Wagner group. And yeah. so Harvath is given the option to go into Ukraine to try to track her down, but he can't bring in any of his teammates with him because it'll yeah. look to the Russians like the Americans are putting boots on the ground. So he's given the option. The Ukrainians can't spare really any men. They can give him a couple of English speakers out of the uh, International Legion. And Harvat decides, you know what? This is an American who needs saving and I'm going to go do it. I'm going to try to find her. And, and his, his bosses are like, you find her and you make every single person who either killed or captured her pay. And that's the idea for uh, Deadfall. Great. So the war in Ukraine obviously is the backdrop for this for this book. Um, you wanted to make it timely, obviously, with what was going on. You also said in um, some other interviews that you wanted to put Harvath in sort of a World War II scenario, something you've always thought about. What was it about World War II? What happened there uh, that was uh, pertinent to uh, to the backdrop and scene here? Well, obviously, uh, in World War II, it couldn't have been any more evident who the bad guys were and who the good guys were. Uh, So it was very black and white. It's very black and white in this conflict. Uh, Anybody that doesn't see the Russians as the absolute aggressors and the embodiment of pure evil here is just deluded. Uh, Either they're deluding themselves, uh, they are not paying attention to what's going on, or they're allowing other people to to delude them. I mean, the Russians invaded a sovereign nation. So uh, I grew up reading great World War II thrillers by the likes of Alistair MacLean. One of my favorites was Where Eagles Dare, which is a great movie with a young Clint 
Clint Eastwood and Richard Burton. And so I always love these stories, even contemporary tellings of World War II stories like Saving Private Ryan, Band of Brothers, Fury about the tank crew with Brad Pitt. And I always wanted my protagonist, Scott Harvath, to have uh, a story, a novel that's like that. But short of getting the doc and the DeLorean and going back in time, there was no way I was going to be able to put Harvath in a World War II scenario until Ukraine came up because it's the largest land war in Europe since World War II. And there's a lot of echoes uh, from World War II that we're seeing play out in Ukraine. There's uh, just the, the just the horrific war crimes being committed by the Russians, which are uh, sure. absolute echoes of what uh, some of the worst Nazi SS brigades did. Uh, it just made sense. And it seemed like an opportunity to put Harvath in one of these stories that I love to read as a, as a kid and love to see in movies now as an adult. Great. So the title of your book is um, Deadfall. Is there any significance to the title and how did you, how did you land um, or, or did you not have full say in that? No, I mean, I go around uh, and around with the publisher and my editor. We went through a lot of different titles and I liked the idea. When we were talking about art in the beginning uh, for the cover, I had uh, images in my head of, you know, trees where the leaves is had just been shorn off and they were just charred mm. in crumbled villages. And I had this idea and the idea of a tree that could either be a trap, a deadfall trap, or trees that are, you know, widow makers that fall over in the woods and kill people. Uh, and then my wife and my youngest uh, on their college tour about a year, year and a half ago had gone to uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's house, Falling Water. And so uh, when I've been thinking about last year's book, Rising Tiger, I was like, Rising Tiger, Falling Water. I'm like, well, I can't call it Falling Water, but <laughs> can I do something with fall? And that's what that's what promoted it, was you kind of pivoting off the rise of last year's title to doing a fall in this this title. And the book obviously has a little bit of a yellow c- color to it. Are, are, was that significance of the Ukraine flag? Yellow and blue, the, you the, betcha. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. Obviously. And then the, um, the the raven sitting on top of the statue obviously plays out in the book. I don't want to yep. g- give it away, but but there's a scene there. There's a scene, um, yeah, there. exactly. It's significant, yep. Yeah, perfect. Um, so Harvath has to go on this mission pretty much on his own. I, he, he does have some assistance from, I think, four guys from the uh, Ukrainian International Legion. Um, why, why, why can't he go with a cohort here? So there's a whole there's a whole thing. I, I read a great nonfiction book about an operation that the S, uh, the uh, OSS did in northern Italy in World War II, and it's called the Bremer Assignment. And it's written by an author, a great great nonfiction author named Patrick O'Donnell. And uh, in it, there is one particular U.S. Uh, OSS member who has to operate a lot on his own away from his team. So for Deadfall, because the U.S. has not committed troops to Russia, Harvath can't take his guys with him. And even if Harvath wanted to smuggle his guys in, I do an explainer in the book about how in the real life, uh, how in real life, the Chinese have hacked particular U.S. government and private sector databases that allow the Chinese and anybody they share intelligence with to kind of triangulate on different American citizens. So several years ago, the Office of Professional Management uh, got, uh, the OPM got hacked. And uh, that's where all the SF-86s are housed, which are the applications for top secret clearance. So when you combine that with the Chinese hack of the IRS, with the hack of some big insurance companies, it doesn't take a lot of time to figure out, okay, all these guys have a military background and like James Bond, they all get their health insurance from international exports or whatever cover company is being used. So for my purposes in the book, I explained that it was too dangerous for Harvath to bring teammates with him and therefore right. kind of dirty dozen style he was going to have to pick up some guys on the ground over there and go with a very small team, four guys uh, that he's never been in combat with, never trained with before. Got it. You have said that this was the most intense thriller you have ever written and the most difficult, emotional, and painful to research. Um, I'd like to know how so, but also, did you know that going in or was this a sort of, as you started the putting pen to paper, I got a, I got a real beast on my hands here. 
Yeah, so I knew it wasn't going to be good, particularly uh, as I was seeing the parallels uh, between what was going on in Ukraine. I mean, the, the war crime started right away from the beginning. So it was not, yeah. it did not take long for the Russians to be slaughtering and targeting uh, innocent civilians. But uh, the, the parallel that I draw, the historic parallel in the book is uh, as World War II was kind of winding up and the, and the Germans were pulling out of Poland, uh, the Russian or the, the Polish home army decided that they would help expedite the exit of the Nazis from Warsaw. And Hitler turned around and threw one of his worst SS brigades at Warsaw from August of 44 to October. And some of the worst war crimes that were committed during World War II outside of concentration camps were committed in and around Poland during this time, uh, particularly by this Nazi SS brigade, which was run by an absolute lunatic. Uh, I mean, he was Freddy Krueger meets Jason meets, uh, you just think of all the worst to the worst. And I mean, this guy was so bad, his fellow Nazis thought he was yeah. bad. So imagine how bad you have to be to have other Nazis go, we don't want anything to do with this guy. And like the Wagner group, the Russian mercenary group, as they were recruiting from prisons and insane asylums, well, back in 44, actually in the 30s all the way into the 40s, this SS brigade was doing the same thing. So Francis Fukuyama said that history doesn't uh, repeat, but it does rhyme. And mm-hmm. so from uh, Hitler being given a slice of Czechoslovakia and the Sudetenland to Putin taking a slice of uh, Ukraine in the east, the Donbass, and taking the Crimean Peninsula. There's a lot of stuff playing out in the real world uh, that's happened before. So I wanted to draw attention to these items, but in in fiction, because that's what I do. Yeah. I'm, I'm supposed to entertain you. Got it. Were you thinking about Deadfall even before you finish Rising Tiger? Because I think you mentioned Ukraine and Rising Tiger, didn't you? Or, or I did. Or, I actually yeah. had somebody that was uh, had crossed the border into Romania who was a, she was a pivotal figure at the end that Harvath helps out at the end of that book. So yeah, yeah. so yeah, there was some talk of Ukraine there. I know you like to write about, um, the places you write about, I know you like to visit. Obviously, um, I, I believe you did not go to Ukraine. Is that, do I have that right? You, right, uh, I did you, not uh, go. So, uh-uh. so, so who did you speak with? I know you speak with special ops, diplomats, intelligence officers, and the like. Um, but, you you know, the detail about the vehicles, the ammunition, the surveillance technology, all of that being deployed in the war effort, um, that must have been a very painstaking task. How, just talk a little bit about um, where you got all that detail and color. So I've got a really good network of people that I was able to plug in, uh, whether it was uh, through people who were training the Ukrainians, uh, people in the International Legion. There, there were a lot of ways that I plugged in to get my details. And the other thing is, is this war is being live streamed everybody's got a GoPro camera. You can go on yeah. YouTube and just watch hours and hours of footage uh, of urban combat, stuff out in the countryside. I mean, it's it's really, really intense. I, as an author, I've never had such a wealth of uh, information, detailed information available to me. So I, I consumed hundreds of hours of footage. Uh, wow. I mean, it was really, really intense. Um. I don't know. I don't, this is maybe a broad based statement, but I I don't think a lot of people, including myself, you know, really understand the scale and atrocities going on in Ukraine. I mean, we always see the flags flying outside people's homes, prayers for Ukraine, all that. But was one of your goals here to really bring to light the brutality of the war uh, or, or, or did it just naturally come as, as a result of you trying to tell a good story? Well, I, I got to be honest with you, Steve. I, there is a very high, there's a militant ignorance that seems to exist in this country right now where people are yeah. woefully ill-informed, under-informed, poorly informed, and they take pride in that. So mm-hmm. my job, first and foremost, is to entertain you. I want everybody to read the book and have a, have a great white knuckle throw ride. If you close the book a little bit smarter, I think that's a good thing because I think probably, you know, people ask me, what do I think our greatest national security risk is? And I think it's social media. I think people isolate themselves in particular social media silos where you're only talking to people who see the world the way you do and think the way you do. So Mm -hmm. therefore, two things happen. No other ideas and information are getting in and you drop your guard. You think everybody on your Facebook page or in your Facebook group sees the world the way you do. That's where the Russians, the North 
Koreans, the Chinese, the Iranians, that's where they love to push disinformation because your guard's down, because you think you're with like-minded people and you believe stuff that's given to you. This war is terrible and we should want it over as soon as possible. There are Russian wives and mothers and children who aren't going to get their husbands and sons and daughters and fathers coming home. Same thing with the Ukrainians. And again, the, one of the things that I think is probably uh, the greatest hallmark of how short a memory we have as a nation is that in the 1990s, real life, when the Soviet Union broke apart, a third of their nuclear arsenal was in Ukraine. And mm-hmm. we begged the Ukrainians, please get rid of these weapons. We will help you. You cannot maintain them and you cannot keep them safe. And it was selfish, Steve. We didn't want a rogue state or some terrorist group to get a, a, a nuke from Ukraine and use it against us to light one yeah. off in D.C. or Miami. And so we promised the Ukrainians, you guys get rid of these weapons. You will never lose a square inch of your sovereign territory. 2014, 1990s, we signed it. They said, get the Russians to sign it. The Russians, as they were constituted then, <laughs> signed it. Yeah. And then 2014, Putin rolled in and uh, and took a huge slice of their territory. And what did we do? We kicked the Russians out of the G8. So that's why we have a G7 now. A few sanctions and a harshly worded letter from the, the current administration at that time. We didn't live up to our obligations. We made a promise to Ukraine. And I think that's important to drive home. And so America really does have a role to play in this war. We're late. We're like a decade late to coming to the aid of Ukraine. We promised them and we need to do it. And I'm glad we're finally doing it. So this nonsense that Ukraine is so corrupt. I'm from Chicago, Steve. Chicago's <laughs> corrupt, but I don't want Canada coming down and stealing yeah. Chicago from the United States, right? Yeah. And the reason Ukraine is so corrupt is because it's still living, it's, it's got the hangover from being part of the Soviet Union. And you know who's yeah. more corrupt than Ukraine? The freaking Russians. They're super yeah. corrupt. You should not want to see the Russians succeed here. People of good yeah. conscience should want this thing, want the Russians out, and people of any moral standing should want this over as soon as possible. Because the Chinese love that we're sending stuff over there and that it's it's taken our stockpiles down. It's great for us that the that we now see the Russian military for the paper tiger that it is, and we'll do our defense planning differently in the future, and we can orient more towards China, which is important. But still, we should want this done as quickly as possible. And the only way that happens is by a resounding defeat of Putin so that there's no yeah. arguments. And so uh, as Hugh Hewitt and I were talking about recently, uh, Hugh's got a great line, which we, is we should give Ukraine everything they want and double the amount of everything they're asking for. Yeah. Well, you're pretty good at predicting. Um, so and, and I don't want to get off topic here. Do you do you foresee this war continuing for 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 some time still? I'll tell you what, I do. I think it is going to, and I'll tell you why. Because the Russian military doctrine is very heavy on how they fortify their defenses. So you Mm. can get defensive lines with the Russians that are 10, 20 kilometers deep. And the Russians use a lot of mines. The Ukrainians don't have uh, enough demining equipment. And the Russians have air superiority. So last year when we thought the HIMARS rockets were going to be a big game changer, well, with their electronic jamming, electronic warfare equipment, they've been able to defeat a lot of the HIMARS. So until they get F-16s and they're trained up, uh, they can get their pilots to transition from MiGs to F-16s and then they can have air superiority it, or at, at least parity, it, it's going to take a while. This is going to drag on for a while, unfortunately. You are listening to Coffee with Closers, a podcast produced by Pinkston, a strategic communications firm based just outside Washington, D.C., Whether your organization is looking for traditional public relations, creative content, or business strategy to support brand awareness or protect against reputational risks, our team of highly dedicated, experienced, and successful communications professionals stand at the ready to help you break through the noise in today's ever-changing and competitive news cycle. For more on our services and capabilities, we invite you to visit us at pinkston.co. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast, which is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Amazon, and iHeartRadio Podcasts. There are other scenes in the book that don't take place in Ukraine. Um, You talk about the Commodore Yacht Club in Washington, D.C. for members of Congress. You talk about the Italian restaurant in the Boston's North End. Were these based on actual places that maybe you have been or others? Or was was this just purely just part of the fun? 
Well, yeah, it's part of the fun. That Commodore Yacht Club, I wanted something that was going to be built out over pylons so that as this absolutely knuckleheaded conspiracy starts that they're doing terrible things in the basement of the Commodore Yacht Club. Uh, you know, people could say there's no basement. It's built over <laughs> the water. It's impossible. So yeah. the Commodore Yacht Club was something interesting. And then uh, I had a buddy of mine in college who had a colleague that owned a restaurant in the North End in Boston. And uh, <laughs> I, I had to go to Boston. It's a different career. I had to make a sales call years and years ago before I became an author. And he said, you got to go to my buddy's restaurant in the North End. And I went and I sat down and the waitress came over and it's like, I'm going to say his last name was Carlucci. It wasn't Carlucci, but it definitely wasn't O'Shaughnessy either. So we're going to go with an Italian <laughs> last name. And the waitress comes over and says, Mr. Carlucci would like you, would like to serve you some Chianti. And I said, it's 1030 in the morning. And she leans in closer and she says, Mr. Carlucci would like you to have some Chianti. I'm like, great. I'll have a Chianti. It's 1030. It looked like a casting call for the Sopranos. It was track suits and everybody was playing dominoes. I mean, it was a, a canasta. So, uh, yeah, so that's a little bit of personal experience there in the north end of Boston. Great. I, I love those restaurants. That's great. It's awesome. And good pizza, too. Yeah. Um, you said your job as a writer is to, quote, beat the headlines. And I think you did here uh, in, in some ways. Call it prophecy. Um, you know, you obviously talked about the Wagner group, the, the savage mercenaries that, that Harvath has to take out. Um, and you, you talked about this, this group even a month before – you know, the, the, the attempted mutiny in, in Moscow. Mm -hmm. Um, what, what, what was your, um, what was your reaction to that? <laughs> So yeah, so they, uh, so the Wagner group sent about 5,000 guys. Uh, they got within 200 kilometers of Moscow. That was on June 23rd, but they took down uh, a, a significant uh, Russian sur military surveillance plane. There were helicopters they knocked down on their way up to Moscow. Uh, now a whole bunch of them allegedly are in Belarus, kind of eyeballing the Polish border, which would be a massive mistake. Um, yep. uh, you know, but the Wagner guys have been around for a while. I've written about them in a few books and they've always been... To carry on the, the Sopranos uh, kind of example, I mean, Russia is a gangster state and there's all these yeah. different kind of capos and things like that. And, and Wagner is just a very well, uh, by Russian standards, uh, is a well-equipped, well well-trained group of extortionists and muscle for, for Putin. They allowed him to, yeah. to play in the affairs of other nations without having direct uh, Kremlin fingerprints on, uh, on those efforts. Wow. That's amazing. You have another character. Mm -hmm. You have a character in this book, Greg Wilson, former disgraced U.S. Senator. Um, I don't want to give away too much here, but he turns out not to be such a good guy. But anyway, it reinforces <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe a, a notion that, that, that has seeped into our society that, you know, politicians in Washington are corrupt, overtaken by the, the quote unquote swamp. Um, was that a picture you wanted to paint? Or again, was this just part of the, the literary license? What were you trying to, what were you trying to get at here in terms of, cause you were probably describing what a lot of people feel Washington is today. Well, no, it is. It's There's a revolving door between K Street and the Hill. So you get these people yeah. that either serve on staff or that are uh, elected representatives that come out and go to work in the uh, as lobbyists and things like that on K Street to then come back and uh, influence politics, influence lawmaking and regulations for the benefit of their high pay paying clients. None of that is illegal. I would argue that that's, that, you know, it, my... I, it, it is a problem, though, I think. I don't think, you know, the Obama administration tried to get rid of this revolving door with K Street, and then it was waiver after waiver after waiver. So even they, with the expressed intent of limiting this, if not putting it uh, as close to an end as possible, still were making exception after exception after exception. Uh, I, I am currently more disheartened with the makeup of the United States Congress than I've ever been before. Uh, wow. I, I see too many people swearing fealty to uh, anything but the uh, the Constitution, and you take an oath to uh, to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States, and uh, that's not happening right now, and that's that's much to our peril as a nation. Where you, if you are more concerned about getting reelected than protecting the Constitution, you're a horrific representative, and you're a horrible American. 
If it's all about yeah. getting reelected, you're 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 terrible. And this lie that so many people in Congress, uh, in the House and the Senate, both tell themselves that uh, oh, if it wasn't for me, there'd be somebody much worse up here. I'm helping keep yeah. things on the rails. You know, that's a nice little thing you might tell yourself in the dark of night to fall asleep. But it's not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to protect and defend the Constitution, stand up, set an example of doing the right thing, and encourage your colleagues to do so. But uh, yeah. there's not a lot of steel in the spines up there, and it's only gotten worse. You think term limits is the answer? I think term limits is the answer, but you also have to deal with staff because staff yeah. hang around for a long time. And, you know, they yeah. go push this button, all this kind of stuff. Term limits, and I got to tell you, I I, I just, uh, you know, poor Mitch McConnell, I know he fell down and he had, uh, you know, he had that moment of freezing in front of the, the microphone. Now, I, I yeah. think that these people that are able to stay in past a certain time, uh, I think it's I think it's not good. Uh, I think we've got a gerontocracy now. I appreciate the service of so many people who have served but I don't think it's a I don't think it's a good thing to be able to keep going back again and again and again. Uh, I think term limits. Listen, the founders were gentlemen farmers. They would come yeah. to, to serve their time and go back to their farms. And now we have people that I, I've heard it said, and I think it's very uh, astute, which is you get people who don't want to go back and live amongst their constituents. They don't like their constituents. They don't ever want to leave D.C. Yeah. And I think that's yeah. wrong. So I'm a big fan of term limits, but I also want to term limit the staff. Uh, too. I don't yeah. want them being that, able to and, serve in perpetuity because that's a problem. And those staff leave and go on to lobbying firms and all that. And then it becomes just a revolving door that just doesn't end. Um, yep. I want to ask you a couple more questions and I want to be mindful of your time. In one scene in this book, you recount a meeting with um, Gretschko and President Peshkov of Russia about Russia's desire to control the Black Sea and the U.S. desires to reposition the Black Sea as a center of NATO forces. Why was that included and instructive in this storyline? It sort of st kind of stuck out for me as sort of something kind of separate but interesting that that uh, that you put in there. What was all? What was that about? It, because it is a fear of the Russians that uh, mm -hmm. NATO is going to try to expand its strength and its footprint in the Black Sea. And what I also wanted to do with that is I was setting up uh, a pivotal moment for Gretschko, this particular mm -hmm. intelligence officer, where he has to go. Uh, there's another person sitting in the room there, a very wealthy Russian who's friends with the mm -hmm. Russian president, who's got yeah. the president's ear. It was also a comment on a lot of the morons we've had in this country who are wealthy who get the ears of politicians and think just because I've sold more Schwinn bicycles in the last decade than any other bike salesman that I can comment on domestic or international policy. And I ought to be able yeah. to, uh, via the size of my bank account, have influence over uh, politicians. I just don't like that. There are a lot of people yeah. who don't know. What, look at look at everything that's exploding in the news right now. All of these idiotic legal theories and all this kind of stuff where, you know, they were trying to overturn the 2020 election. I, it, yeah. it, it's insane sanity that these people who should not be anywhere near the levels levers of power are getting so close and actually placing their hands and helping to move them a little bit. So that was my big commentary on politicians that listen too much to people who don't know what they're talking about. Got it. A recent CNN poll found that 55% of Americans say the U.S. Congress should not authorize funding to support Ukraine. I thought it was interesting because in the book, you talk about a wealthy American asphalt magnate who wants Senator Wilson to lobby on Capitol Hill on his behalf because this guy doesn't want any more U.S. support going to the country. Were you tapping into that? Uh, were you tapping into those sentiments there? I was trying to give voices from every angle on this. So yeah. there, there are people that want to isolate, uh, don't want us to be doing anything for, for Ukraine, and then there's other people that do. And uh, there's some great polling that just came out, and I wish I'd had it when I was writing the book, that actually breaks down at least right of center, it was a Fox News poll uh, in the Republican Party, of where support for Ukraine lies. And actually the uh. biggest block of support are people 60 and older who remember the Cold War. So when you get uh, down to 18 to 29 year olds, the, the support is much lower. So people who actually have a memory of what Russia is and what Russia is capable of and what they've done are much more supportive of, uh, of Ukraine than a younger generation who's never actually seen what the Russians have done. Uh, they don't have any life experience with Russia. So that stuff's fascinating. But I was trying to get in as many opinions into the book as possible, because I know I've got readers who, who may not want us sending military equipment uh, uh, or other kinds of assistance to Ukraine. And so I wanted to address that too and not just be one avenue throughout the whole book. 
Got it. Two last questions. Earlier this year, we had the Chinese spy balloons hovering over the United States. Then we had the recent news of two U.S. sailors arrested for allegedly selling military secrets to China. As you think about Russia and China and all that's going on geopolitically, I know you talked about social media as a great threat in this country. Where do you see the hottest, the greatest threats, the push points, the flash points, whatever you want to call it? Uh, China's really, um, really banging on the door here. Anybody else? Yeah, th- well, China's a big problem, and we need to be focusing a lot more attention on our Navy and building up our ship strength. We're, we're falling behind there. Um, yeah. Yeah, you know what? On that China spying thing, it, it is very interesting because apparently one of those spies who's of Chinese uh, descent, uh, his mom was encouraging him to spy so that he could actually go back to China and get a job with from the CCP. I mean, this is yeah. this is this is crazy, crazy. So I think China remains one of our biggest threats. Uh, we obviously can never take our eye off North Korea or Iran, uh, mm-hmm. but yeah, you know, I, I get I'm I get more and more concerned as we fracture as a na- nation and we get so tribal and we we are we are not united. We we care more about scoring points against the opposite team, our fellow countrymen and women, that we become more susceptible to misinformation, disinformation and a, a, a loss of esteem that we have for our own nation. And I worry that we're going to see more of this kind of spying and giving top secret stuff to the enemy because people have, you know, another Bradley Manning or a Edward Snowden kind of a thing. I, I worry about that because I think our enemies are constantly there ready to snap it up from anybody who's willing to give it to them. So book number 23, we'll see in a year's time or so. Is that, That's is that it. safe Next to summer. say? All right. Yeah. That sounds great. Brad, Brad, is there anything you wanted to add to our discussion today that I did not ask you? Uh, you're such a pro, Steve. You, you ask me that every, uh, every time we do this. And sometimes I've got something for you and sometimes I don't. No, this is pretty wide ranging. You know, the, the one thing that I will say is for anyone yeah. who's never read a Brad Thor book, I tell people yeah. that, yeah, I've got I've 23 books overall, 22 in this particular series. Uh, but you don't need to have ever read one of my books before to yeah. get Deadfall and start right there. It's like the James Bond movies. You can go out and yeah, see the great. newest Bond film. Uh, uh, and it doesn't matter if you've seen any of the pri- prior ones. Just like you and I were talking about Mission Impossible before we started rolling, you go out and see Dead Reckoning tomorrow. It doesn't matter yeah. if you've not seen any of the prior ones. You're not going to feel like you're missing out. So same thing with my yeah. books. Yeah, and the thing about Mission Mission Impossible is that was Dead Reckoning Part 1 after two and a half hours. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I can't imagine what Part 2 is. Hey, Brad, I had one last question for you. Um, you talked in this sure. book a lot about Pe- Pe- President Peshkov of Russia, or the fictional Russian president that you've talked about mm-hmm. before. The, you obviously had a situation earlier in the book that starts the ball rolling here right near the White House. But you don't really bring the – you don't really have the U.S. president uh, really – talking about this issue, you leave it more to the FBI and DC homicide and some of these other uh, agencies. Was that, was that, it was that intentional? Yeah. You know, what's funny is I stopped writing several years ago about uh, things happening inside the white house because no matter how much I fictionalized it, People always yeah. thought I was talking about whatever the current administration was, and people were getting angry. And I'm like, it's make-believe. It's fiction. I made it up. But it's like uh, a Rorschach test. And I thought, you know what? I was getting either people like, oh, you didn't go hard enough against this president, or you do too soft, yeah. whatever. It, it was just – it was weird, and I just thought, you know what? I want I don't want people to bump when they're reading the books. I just want them to be just – swept away by the the thrill of the story. So I've just purposely taken a step back from setting anything inside the White House because I'm not trying to write about any particular personality or administration. So it's just it's just best to kind of steer clear of the White House in in my estimation. Great. Deadfall. It's out now. Go to Amazon or wherever you get your books. Uh, Well done, Brad, again on another uh, another successful thriller. And uh, thanks for joining us. And we'll see you. uh, We'll see you 2024. So you bet. Thanks, thanks so much. Steve. A, B, C. A, always B, B, C, closing. Always be closing. Always be closing. We're the Pinkston team, and this has been Coffee with Closers. Be sure to subscribe for more episodes and follow us on Twitter, TikTok, and LinkedIn. Catch us next time.
We know you're not busy. 